Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Arb Association, people. Welcome back to webinar. If you've been with us before, you do not need to adjust your set. You might be looking at the screen right now and thinking, blimey, John Parker looks good. Suddenly kind of gone back in time a little bit. He's kind of got back 10, 15 years younger. Maybe he stopped smoking or something like that. Don't worry. Back, you don't need to Back to, to a technical yourself. officer, you mean. <laughs> back to a technical officer. That's fine. Nothing wrong with being a technical officer, John. It's not. It's not. It's me instead. I've been graciously put in charge or stolen charge from John this evening. Uh, for those of you who are new, for BAT people, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Arb Association webinars. And for this evening of BAT versus Trees, we have some fantastic people lined up to speak this evening. And this is a kind of a virtual trop top trumps, if you will. So we have picked five topics and then we have spoken to some wonderful people in both the tree world and in the bat world. And we're going to pit them against each other in a kind of friendly battle. And it's all going to be clean above the belt. So no low blows, please, people. We're going to keep it nice and civil. Look at the messages coming in. This is great fun being on this side of things. Cool. So right then, let me bring my slides up. We have some lovely little graphics I'm going to bring up as well. I'm very excited about these graphics. So but bats versus trees. Here we go. Cool. So up first, we have, I know it says round two. You'll have to ignore that. We made some last minute changes back, backstage. So round one is actually going to be on reproduction. So... Team Tree, who is your speaker for reproduction, please? Hello, Jim. Uh, our speaker for reproduction is Alan Crawford. Alan, over to you. Smashing. Hey, so my name's Alan. Uh, I'm going to talk on behalf of the trees on the topic of reproduction, where to stand are most unusual. So we all know that trees grow when their seed makes contact with the mineral soil. The seed germinates, grows into a seedling, a sapling, and if it escapes the attention of browsing animals into a young tree, a mature tree, then perhaps eventually into an ancient tree, by which time, of course, it provides extraordinary habitat for a whole range of different forms of life, bats included. Excuse me, that's my alarm going off. <laughs> and of course, trees grow with the roots embedded in the soil, and their crowns reaching for the sky. Well, that is what happens on most, on most occasions, but on some occasions, the tree will manage to set seed, not in the mineral soil directly, but within the crown of another living tree. This happens with a huge range of species, but within the UK, the most common association is between a rowan that grows within the crown of an existing alder tree. When this happens, the rowan is known as either an air tree, a cuckoo tree, or my favourite term, a flying tree. And I think if you look at the images on screen just now, you can see why that term's appropriate. So how does this happen? The next two slides show half a dozen different images of the process. So starting from the left-hand side, where we have a, a young rowan within the crown of an old alder tree, and as that, and then just the continuation of that process through these three images, and then the next three on the next slide. In each occasion here, the rowan is the tree that is the lighter coloured and smaller stemmed parts within the middle of each image, and the alder tree is the darker stemmed, thicker stems towards the outside of the image. And you'll see by the time we get to the third image that the alder tree is becoming a little bit older and veteranized. It's lost a significant limb and the rowan is more, it's very clearly growing down and through the main alder stem. Then these next three images on this slide show the progression of this relationship effectively. Uh, the image on the left-hand side, you can see that the alders decayed significantly more than in the earlier images. And you can now see the stilt roots of the rowan growing down through the main stem of the alder and into the mineral soil now. The middle one, middle image, you can see that the old alders decayed even further. 
and you can see the stilt roots there. And then by the time you get to the image on the right hand side, the alder has effectively disappeared. And the only thing that gives us a clue to the fact that this rowan has gone through this process and did seed itself within the crown of another tree is the remaining stilt roots. Now you'll notice that the tree has partly blown. That's because the stilt roots tend not to be that solid or that firm. This tree isn't quite leaning on the ground yet, but when we look at the next image, that's exactly what's happened here. And we have a tree that was once a flying rowan and is now what would be termed a phoenix rowan. So a tree that's blown over but remained alive. And what were at one point the branches are now the main stems that are growing up from the fallen main limb. And of course, at some point, this will set seed. The berries will be eaten by the songbirds, as was the case in the first instance. Songbirds will fly off. They may then rest on the crown of the old alder tree. They'll do what all living creatures do. And when they, they um, get rid of the seed, the seed will then germinate within a pocket of soil within the crown of the alder tree, as you saw in the, the initial slides. And then the the whole process will continue. So given we've just a, a short presentation, I'd like to finish there, but leave you with a quote from the 1800s by a chap called Hodding Carter II, who said, there are only two lasting bequests that we can hope to give our children. One is roots and the other is wings. I've always really loved that quote and part of what I really like about it is it gives a clue as to why it's so difficult to care a, both for children or for anybody else that we feel close to because there's very little in this world that has both roots and wings but perhaps the flying rowan shows us that it is possible to have both roots and wings. Thanks very much for listening. That's me Dan. Cheers. Thank you very much, Alan. Very strong start from tree team tree there. Bet you didn't expect to have flying trees. How impressive was that? And I love the bit, the kind of uh, the poetic bit at the end of trees, uh, flying and roots. How amazing is that? We had a bit of chat in the, uh, in the chat talking about trees being cannibals and they're kind of the rebirth from death as well, which is very, very nice. So yes, yeah, a very strong start there. Thank you very much for that, Alan. So... Team Bat, I believe we have Gail Armstrong who's going to talk about reproduction for Team Bat. When you're ready, Gail, we'd love to hear. Okay, so uh, that's my se session, the reproduction, if I can match the last one. Like other mammals, bats uh, give birth to live young, and the young of a bat is known as a pup. A pups are born naked and blind like a lot of other mammals and uh, the bat suckles their pup on their milk. So all those things they've got in common with all, most mammals. But what's special about bats is female bats can delay their pregnancy until there's enough food around. And they usually just have one pup a year, sometimes twins. And a bat pup is one third of the mother's weight when it's born, which means that would be the equivalent of a human uh, woman giving birth to a 40 pound baby. There you go, that's how amazing bats are. So that's what a young bat looks like when it's newborn. You'll see there how big its feet are and the little claws on the ends of its wings, which are its thumbs. And the feet and thumbs are really important for a newborn bat to hang on to the mum's fur. Sometimes they can have twins, and even with twins, an adult female bat can fly and carry those twins with her. And you can see how those two are hanging on. But baby bats grow really quickly, and this pup on the left of this photograph is only two weeks old. That's how quick that little one has grown, almost as big as its mum. And that's because bat milk is really rich and nutritious. Now, I've just got a few little examples of um, the reproductive strategies of that. So um, in Texas, uh, this is the Congress Bridge in Austin, Texas, and underneath this bridge 
In the summer, there are 1 million Mexican free-tailed bat mothers tucking in under the bridge. When they fly out at night, those bats um, eat the insect pests from the surrounding farmland. They fly all night and feed. And they actually save the farmers millions of dollars uh, from uh, pesticides that they don't have to use because the bats are eating the pests. But when those mothers fly back, Un to, to roost in their bridge for the daytime, they've got to find their own little one out of all the bats that are tucked up under the bridge. And each mother bat finds its own pup by listening for the sound and when they get close by the smell of the little pup. So each mother bat, being a diligent mother, looks after her own pup. Now, just a couple of other examples. There are, so there are very diligent mother bats. There are also diligent father bats. And this little bat, the Dayak fruit bat, which is a very small fruit bat found in Malaysia and Borneo. And this bat has been known to lactate, a male bat lactating, to give a helping hand to the mother and feed the young. Now, most bats only have one or two pups a year because they only have one pair of teeth, one pair of nipples. But the red bat from North America has two pairs of nipples and sometimes gives birth to four pups at a time. And all four of those will be hanging on her when she's hung up in her tree and she looks after up to four pups. So that's remarkable. And a piece of research just published, so you're some of the first people to hear about this, uh, showed that Ju Egyptian fruit bat juveniles are carried around by mum when she's flying and feeding at night. And they're carried around upside down, hanging on and looking at the world upside down from underneath mum. But what's amazing is that the Egyptian fruit bat brain flips that map in the baby bat's head so it's the right way up. So when that baby bat is ready to fly, it knows where everything is and it can navigate and find its way around its habitat because it saw the world upside down while its mum was carrying it and it, the bat's brain has flipped it the right way up. And this, the last one is my favourite bat, Hypsignathus monstrosus, they called this bat when they discovered it, and monstrosus means like a monster. But he's not a monster, he's a very gentle fruit-eating bat from West Africa. He lives in small family groups and he's got this elongated nose uh, because he can fill that with air and make a honking sound in the night to attract a female bat. And I've got, I hope this will work, I've got um, a little sound here and I've shared my sound and you'll be able to hear the honking of the hammer-headed bats in the West African night. That's known as a lek site. So that's our lovely hammerhead fruit bats. So that's me finished. And I hope you'll realise that reproduction, you should take team bat. Thank you. Lovely job. Thank you very much, Gail. I love that kind of plea at the end as well. Kind of, please, team bat, please. So we heard there, I think bats certainly have the edge on trees in terms of speed with reproduction and how quickly they grow as well. We heard from Alan about, you know, the, the time and the processes going on with the flowering rounds in, in particular, the time that takes. We even heard about fruit eating bats as well. So bats eating parts of trees, but then that's helping them with reproduction. So kind of who's winning there? We heard about reproduction under a bridge as well. And I'm, I may have seen that with trees. I'm not quite sure I've seen it that often. I guess it could happen. We've had some fantastic comments in the chat as well. Some very, very bad puns in there about cricket. Bat, willows, love it. Great. Carry on with that. Absolutely. Um, so it's now decision-making time. We've had a few people kind of claim their allegiances in the chat, whether they're already team bat or team tree, but it's now time to put it to the vote. So in the second, Sarah's going to uh, launch a poll for us. I believe it's up already. So you get a choice of either bats or trees. I'm going to share this with you. I had a text off of Sarah whilst Gail was talking then, which just said, bats are amazing. You're, on the, you're meant to be on team tree, Sarah. What's that about? 
Very good. Okay. How are we doing with votes, Sarah? I can't see anything. I can see that the, the vote's up. Are they coming in? Sarah, you've gone quiet on me. Where are you? Yep, they're coming in. They're coming <laughs> Lovely. In. We are on bats 57, trees 43. All oh, but it's changing. 56 to 44. Oh, should I end poll? I'll end poll now. We're, we? We'll give them five more seconds, okay. shall we? All for right. people who haven't Hold voted. On. Count them down. <laughs> okay, five, four, three, two, one. Let's close it there. What have we got? We, can you see those results? We are on bats, 56, trees, 44. Oh, no, that's not come up, Sarah, but round one to team bat, it looks like. Me. Well done, there Gail. You go. There you go. Sorry, my fault. Well fought from Gail there. Commiserations to Alan, but thank you very much for the, the stories about the flying rounds, Alan. Great stuff. Lovely job. Okay. Well, that's just round one out of five. So let me bring my slides up again. So again, ignore the round one stuff. We changed that. This is round two. So we are moving on to appearance. Let's switch it up this time. Should we go to team bat first? So I believe we are hearing from the great Mr. Steve Parker. We have two Parkers pitted against one another here in this round. This is the battle of the Parkers. Ah, Let, let's keep it clean, shall we? I'll, I'll try, but I'm not promising. Um, <laughs> right, right, where are we? Share screen. Right, okay. So I am a last minute recruit to this. Um, so I was only engaged to this really late last night. So I hope this is a really good um, presentation for you. I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour of the diversity of bats and their appearance. Um, and, uh, you know, but really bats, they've got it in the bag already, haven't they? Surely. I mean, hands down, sorry, wings down. Um, so that's the standard of my jokes. I'm really sorry. I'm so confident they've got it. I've even given you a towel for the tree people to throw in to hand it over. Okay, so let's go. I mean, how can they compete with this? The appearance of bats, this wonderful little fruit bat feeding on a mango just to start with. And how can you compete with this? You've got no chance. May as well give up now. Okay, this is a, an orphan spectacle flying fox. Um, that's been rescued in uh, one of the, uh, the rescue centres in Queensland in uh, Australia. So beauty, as we all know, is in the eye of the beholder. And as we have a lot of beholders on the call this evening um, and voting, I wanted to show something for everyone to highlight the incredible diversity of that. So I was thinking about trying to show you all 15, so 1,454 species and just doing the subliminal messaging by flashing them up. But I thought that's a bit cheating a bit, really. So hopefully this will be of interest to you. The appearance of straw coloured fruit bats at Kasanka National Park in Zambia is a phenomenal hold, hold. It's brilliant, but it's even better close up when you get one of these bats in the hand. These are quite large flying foxes. Um, you can see where they got their name, um, the straw coloured fruit bat. And they have about a one meter wingspan and weigh something in the region of about 300 to 350 grams. So, really quite large bats, but nowhere near as big as the biggest bat, which is the golden crown flying fox, which is found in Indonesia and across Asia. This bat has a massive five foot six wingspan and weighs just over a kilogram. So, absolutely huge, amazing. It's only right to move from the largest bat to the smallest, and not just the smallest bat, but the smallest known mammal in the world. This is Kitty's hognose bat, and you'll have to believe me from this picture, it does have a little hognose, but it's also known as the bumblebee bat, which illustrates how tiny it actually is. Um, it can only fly for half an hour at a time because it's so small. Fabulous. We better spend some time looking at our UK bats though. So I thought we'd start with the greater horseshoe bat. You can see exactly why it's called the greater horseshoe. It's got this horseshoe shaped nose leaf right there in the middle of the picture there. And this is um, to enable it to um, make its very focused uh, echolocation calls to find its way around and find its prey. And um, th these bats are uh, pear shaped, pear sized rather, shaped like a pear as well. You can see it's quite round and uh, the wings don't quite close. And who can resist the more beautiful brown long ear bat, the poster bat of British bat conservation? Stunning. These amazing ears are so sensitive they can hear the footsteps of a moth walking across a leaf. And that's exactly how they feed, by catching the insects as they walk across leaves. Wonderful. The tiny torpedo shaped 
for fast flight soprano pipistrelle. If you see bats around the garden, then there's a good chance that they're going to be one of the species of pipistrelle. And to all intents and purposes, when they're flying around, they look the same. Absolutely tiny. They'd fit just across maybe the top tip of your thumb. And um, they weigh about five grams and they eat thousands of little midges and insects each night. They weigh the same as a 2P coin. Absolutely remarkable. These trees were particularly boring. They couldn't even be bothered to develop features for bats to use. So we decided to improve them and we chucked some bat boxes up and they worked and the bats moved in. And they are commonly, um, we commonly encounter our largest British bat, the, the nocturnal bat, at this particular site using these boxes and they're these amazingly they're um, gin, sleek ginger fur very short fur they've got very long narrow wings to enable them to fly incredibly fast and they can often be found seen early in the evening flying with swifts when they're catching the insects um, very high flyers and then they'd make these amazing stooping dives back overseas and um, well we're into some of these uh, more mm, individualized features now this is the sword nosed bat and it uses this nose leaf to direct its echolocation calls to, um, uh, to find its prey. It feeds in woodland and uh, forest areas and gleans insects from the leaves. So it needs, again, this focus beam and this, this nose leaf. That's almost as a, a parabola to sort of to focus the, the, uh, the echolocation calls. And yeah, it gets even more strange. So almost quite bizarre, the ghost-faced bat, sometimes described as a face that only a mother could love, but I would disagree. I think they're fascinating. Um, admittedly, we can't see where the ear ends and where the mouth starts and the nose, and we've got all these little flaps of skin, um, but you can see that there's an eye there and it's quite distinctly a, a bat and uh, a, 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 an ideally suited for its circumstance. A very high flying bat, a very fast bat again, but it gets stranger still. We move on to the wrinkle-faced bat, sometimes referred to as the old man bat, um, Centurio senex. I don't mind admitting to you that the first time I saw one of these and got one in the hand, which is just over two years ago in, uh, in Costa Rica, my eyes filled up and not because it was so ugly. This is an absolutely stunning bat. It's gentle. It's got an intelligent look in its eye and the eyes are golden colored as well. You might just see off the edge of the screen there, there's a little white shoulder patch. They also have this um, flap of skin underneath the chin, which acts like a hood, which they can cover their face with. And no, no, it's not because they're so ugly. Okay, we don't really know what they do with it. They also have these amazing translucent panels in the wing that you can see. And we only recently discovered that these are used by the males in particular to make a particular sound when it comes to uh, when they flap their wings, when it comes to the mating season. OK, I'm talking of mating. The males, the male Chapin's free tail bat, which is found in southern, southern and central Africa, uh, uses an amazing mohawk, uh, this great crest that it's got here to illustrate that it is available and um, interested. Uh, just the males have these. Most of the time it's uh, tucked away in a little pouch on the top of its head, but then it extends this mohawk. So these are the, the punk bats of the, uh, of the bat world. I reckon it's echolocation calls for fellow punk enthusiasts or something along the lines of oi, 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 oi. So, um, but uh, we'll, that remains to be seen. I'm not sure that we've seen that on the sonograms. <laughs> Onto the butterfly bats, these stunning bats. You can see perhaps why they got their name. Painted bats that they're sometimes called as well. These are from Asia. This one was photographed in Thailand. And um, uh, they fly during the day to escape um, sort of predators and from risk. And they fly very differently to the way that they would feed at night. They're flying more like a butterfly, very slow, graceful, quite low flight. Uh, whereas at night they'd be sort of a bit higher and more flying, more like a bat. Um, so it's a, 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 a ruse to uh, escape predation or risk of predation. But they also roost in uh, uh, dead, dried uh, banana leaves, which, uh, which is why this orange color works as a camouflage for them as well. Moving continents, there is another butterfly bat in Africa, the variegated butterfly bat, which again, absolutely stunning colors in this one. So I just wanted to show that this diversity of coloration along these bats, where you can see this, this wonderful, really thick yellow fur that they've got, and this amazing venation pattern and uh, colors on the wings. Fabulous, fabulous. And then we move on to a relatively newcomer to the bat world, the panda bat. Oh, no, no, that's the wrong picture. Uh, there's the panda bat. Um, so um, again, more coloration, sometimes, uh, you know, almost, almost badger-like in the face there, isn't it, as well? So again, great diversity, cracking. Another great 
coloration of a bat. This is a vampire bat from Panama, and um, it uh, has golden colored fur, and that's probably likely to ammonia build up in the roost, but they look absolutely incredible. These bats have an amazing nose leaf system. They have heat sensitive pits here, so they can find the best place on their prey animal in which to bite with these amazing um, uh, sharp incisors that they've got. And they've evolved this, this little groove in their chin, which enables them to be able to lap up blood more efficiently as well. So really quite fabulous features, all designed to with uh, hunting and feeding in mind. Wonderful. And of course, I've got to put in the fluffy baby vampire bat, um, a beautiful little bat that we saw in Trinidad. Um, tree people, are you, um, are you are you giving up yet? I'm not seeing that tail yet, but um, yeah, it's going to be hard to beat this one. Anyway, let's carry on. It's just been Easter, of course. So I thought we'd better put in a, an Easter bunny bat for you, or otherwise known as the large-eared slip-faced bat. Um, we're not very descriptive, well, we're quite descriptive at the times and not very uh, great at coming up with names for them. So large-eared and it's got a slit down its face, uh, right in the middle of its nose there, hence its name. And of course, Easter is virtually over, well, it is over, and we're moving into May. And on May the 4th, we have the good old Star Wars Day, you know, May the 4th be with you and all that. And uh, this is the Yoda bat, so I thought it's appropriate just to show this one. And I think, I think this one is probably smiling because it knows that trees are getting shredded. But maybe we should ask the bats. What do you think, bats? Do you think the trees are going to win? <laughs> yep, me the same. Uh, and what about you, cave door nectar bat? Yep, absolutely. Totally agreed. So I will leave you with the Honduran tent making bats. These fuzzy white cotton ball, uh, cotton wool balls that live in tents that they build. You can see at the bottom of the picture there. And these are from Costa Rica. And then just to really do the mic drop at the end, there's one with its little baby. Fabulous. Thank you. Lovely job. Thank you very much, Steve. A strong start there. For appearance for bats you took us on a bit of a roller coaster there steve you started off with the orphan bats i don't think trees can kind of compete with orphan isn't you know that's a tricky one to be especially with the big cute eyes that that fruit bat had you brought out the big guns the brown long ear bat of course and then you went you did you took a very odd turn down a road of the ghost fake bat and the wrinkled face bats as well but you brought it back interesting terms i guess some people might find those attractive you talked about a face only a mother could love you brought about with the punk bats and uh the kind of the, the curiosities at the end i like the yoda bat that was very cool i've not heard of that before so that that tickled yeah. me as well very good okay thank you so up next then we have our association's very own mr john parker who's going to talk us talk to us about the appearance of trees over to you john when you're ready Hi there. What, what an ugly collection of bats they, they really were. Um, disappointing, Steve. Disappointing. Uh, you can just see my screen as it's supposed to be, Jim, can't you? I'm never normally on this side of a webinar. That's right. It's looking um, good, John. Yeah. We were told we had five minutes, didn't we? But I think Team Bat were, were cheating, I, I believe. I don't want to call in an inquiry just yet. But... Uh, Hi, everybody. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to, to tell you about how great trees look because they just look awesome. We, and, and I was thinking, shall I try and do something big and clever and, and effusive to explain to you why trees are more attractive and greater appearance than bats? And I decided, no, I'll just go through the vast number of photos of trees that I have on my computer uh, and I'll show you how lovely they are because look at this. Forest bathing, Shinrin Yoku, walking through the forest, relaxing yourself. It's healthy to look at trees. It's not healthy to look at bats. It's weird, isn't it? They're all the little, little ear things. And the, no, no, no. We want trees to improve your mental health and your well-being. And a bit of forest bathing will sort you right out. Also, I have to say, all of the photographs I've taken for this little, uh, this little presentation uh, are all pretty much around here in Stonehouse. Um, you haven't got to go far to find amazing, beautiful trees, open grown sycamores like uh, this is a little cluster of sycamores. One big open grown sycamore by itself. Sycamores are weeds, we get told all the time. Even the weeds of the tree world look amazing. Look at the, the stem on that. Absolutely fantastic. I think there might be bats in there. Didn't see any pictures of trees living on bats in Steve's presentation, but I'm sure there's lots of bats living in the trees that you're seeing today. Trees next to the pub, come on now, you can sit in the pub and look at a tree, that relaxes you, I always find it works down the globe. Um, the beautiful globe willow, 
it's the diversity, isn't it? How many variations can you really have on a little flying rat thing? They're all essentially the same, but trees, the diversity, the majesty of trees. Look at this. I mean, I don't think we had an age round in the end, but this is a U. It's at least a thousand years old. Conifers are beautiful. Broadleaf trees are beautiful. The bark, look at the diversity. London plain bark, absolutely magnificent. We've got flowers. We've got hawthorn flowers. We've got, uh, uh, this is an amelanchier on the right-hand side here. Again, all in stone house, all within a stone's throw of where I am now. The tulip tree. Surely the tulip tree, winner of the Urban Tree World Cup last year, could carry this round all by itself. Amazing leaves. Look at the leaf shape on there. It's absolutely beautiful. There's a reason that that's been adopted by the Arb Association as one of the backdrops to many of our posters and things. And the flowers of the tulip tree. Absolutely amazing. And uh, I certainly feel more relaxed just by looking at a tree that lovely. I took these pictures outside the office about half an hour ago. I tried to find pictures of bats to show you out outside the office half an hour ago, but they weren't there. Are they even real? Nobody knows. You never see them. But this is right outside my window and I can see it through my blinds right now. Absolutely stunning. So beautiful that David Hockney paints them. I haven't seen the David Hockney bat selection yet. It might be out there, but he certainly did lots of amazing stuff about trees. They even look great when they're falling apart. You might have noticed in Steve's presentation, there was no photographs of dying or dead bats. That's because they don't look so good then. But trees, as they fall apart, as they age, as they sort of reach this amazing maturity and ancient ages, they still look absolutely incredible. Sometimes they look a bit like a, a skull, like this one. And even when they're dead they're cool you won't see dead bats being put forward as a reason to vote it's probably illegal don't go out there yourself and do that it's not my field of expertise but you're not supposed to, to do anything along those lines with bats but look dead trees doing so much habitat biodiversity and also incredible sort of architectural value in our countryside they even look great when they're small. Oh, look at my tiny bats. Well, look at our tiny trees. They're still fantastic in their little pots. You can keep one at home and you can look after it. You don't keep, well, some of you probably do keep bats at home, but you're not supposed to. And you can keep one of these at home and very nice they are too. And again, the diversity. Look at the beautiful flowers of the horse chestnut. Yes, a, a magnolia in the background there. And I haven't even gone into autumn colour. We could do a full presentation just about autumn colour and appearance, but this is a, a Cappadocian maple. Look at the colours there, absolutely beautiful. And uh, by some ridiculous fluke, I am going to finish pretty much exactly on five minutes, but uh, a little sunset image there of a fantastic tree. Its appearance is fantastic. Trees have a greater appearance than bats. You should all vote tree. You made a terrible mistake in the last round, but we forgive you. We love you and we forgive you and you can put it right now. So please vote Team Tree for appearance. Thank you. Said like a true politician there, John. Ragging on the other team rather than coming up with ideas of your own. I'm going to have to <laughs> reprimand you straight out the gate because you talked about flying rodents. You know that's not true. Stop talking rubbish. You're, but, 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 no, you, you had your time. Mute yourself. Mute yourself. Get back in your box. Anyway, we'll move forward. We'll be constructive, shall we, from here on in. I like that. It got a little bit personal, but I guess that started with Mr. the other Mr. Parker as well, with Steve. But that's cool. I like that. Uh, the, the line, you can sit in a pub and look at a tree. Wow. How, you should write poetry, John, really. How fantastic is that? Um, I like the tiny trees, though. That was quite cool. That was very nice. I thought Steve may have it on tiny bats, but yeah, tiny trees, that's quite magnificent isn't it really? Good stuff. Okay. Well, you've heard the case for Team Bat. You've heard the case for Team Tree. Should we open the voting then? Let's see how we fare on round two appearance. We'll give you a few minutes to make your mind up and cast your vote. Will you be swayed by the vast range of appearances of bats from all around the world, the good, the bad, and the ugly? Or will you be dragged down into the, the mire pit with John, just kind of slinging mud and hope that it would stick to his opponent? Shall we see? There was a, a few things in the chat that made me 
chuckle along the way as well. I love this watching this. Oh, how look at that. Oh, just as if the man needed more, his ego feeding anymore. Oh, 69 to 31. Congratulations, John. Commiserations, Steve. But thank you both. That was great fun. Look at that. There you go. Turns out slingy mud does get you places. Who knew? Who knew? Okay. Shall we move on promptly to round three? You'll be glad to hear that my slides from here on in are in the correct order. We stopped messing around with these. <laughs> I like the, the silhouette of uh, somebody doing some form of martial arts there. That's great. So we are going to move on to round three, defense. So should we switch back to team tree again? So I believe it's our good friend, Lynn, who's going to talk to us about defense. We are ready when you are, Lynn. Thank you. So, tree defense. Most trees are resistant to most pathogens most of the time. Ah, I hear you say. What about ash dieback and invasive pathogens? Well, yeah, these things do occur. There are occasionally problems. They're usually brought about by man's activities. But other groups of organisms, including bats, can be affected en masse in similar ways. So, for example, the bat white nose disease caused by the fungus Pseudogymnoascus destructans affects very many bat species. It eats away at their fat layer and they don't come out of hibernation. And indeed, the little brown myotis is now facing extirpation in East, Eastern North America because of this. Now, bats are short lived, mostly less than 20 years, but long lived entities have amazing defenses. They have preformed defenses like this castle with its huge, tall, thick walls, the gate, um, the huge cliffs, rapidly flowing rivers, also has active or induced defenses, such as um, when man is on the top, throwing down boiling oil at the enemies or shooting arrows. Well, trees have preformed defenses too. Their woody tissues are covered in body armor in the form of bark. The bark offers physical defense and chemical defense. In fact, much of the tree is often covered by cutin or subrin or waxes or has thick cell walls or contains inhibitory compounds called phytoanticipins, which are there already to kill anything that tries to invade. Trees also get a helping hand from allies and mercenaries from other kingdoms. So, for example, the fungal endophytes in trees produce chemicals that can inhibit bacteria or oomycetes, pathogenic fungi, grazing invertebrates, and indeed larger animals too. They have mercenaries in the form of mycorrhizal fungi, which are paid by sh sugars from photosynthate. They have a first, offer a first line of defense against soil-borne diseases. The antagonistic mycelium produces all sorts of compounds which kill soil-borne pathogens. If this first line of defense is breached, then the uh, mycelium, the sheath around those young roots, forms a second line of defense. But of course, the tree itself can have active and induced defenses. There's a rapid defense immediately that a, a pathogen gets in. A burst of oxidative activity, nitrous oxide, lots of chemicals. There's also something called a hypersensitive response where cells actually commit suicide to save the rest of the tree. And you'll think, how can a cell commit suicide and save the rest of the tree? Well, there are pathogens which can only live and pa parasitically suck out nutrients from living cells. If that cell has killed itself, if that plant cell has killed itself, then so too the pathogen is gone. Trees also have a slower defense. They can gradually produce chemicals, phytoalexins, lignification, suberization, and they also have a systemic resistance where they send messages around the tree to get the plant in readiness to respond to attack in all sorts of places, in all sorts of quarters. Now, we all know that decay is usually confined to the vicinity of wounds. This is a well-known picture. Decay fungi can't extend into functional sapwood because of the high water content, a passive defense. There are some living cells in sapwood and they can induce defense. They can respond. They can produce chemicals. 
which defend against uh, ingress from other organisms and prevent water loss. Uh, also, the living cells that are attached to those dead xylem vessels, which transport water from the roots to the shoots, can help to defend too. If a vessel is damaged or broken, the living cell produced little bulges in, into the vessels, tyloses, which are covered in gums, which block the damaged vessels and seal off any damage. When new tissues form, a new layer is formed called the barrier zone. This is a defensive layer. You can see the differences in the cell width and they are impermeable tissues formed to protect new xylem. Now, when leaves are eaten, bitten by grazers or pathogens arrive, that stimulates the leaves to, to form volatile chemicals into the air. And these can spread from one neighbor to another, giving warning, early warning, that there's an attack imminent, forewarned, is forearmed. They're beginning to defend even before the nuisance has arrived. And this happens through the mycorrhizal network as well. Messages are sent from tree to tree. Well, I'm gonna leave my defense on this last note and let the tree say it. Organisms that live for hundreds of years or even perhaps over a thousand years have awesome defenses. They must have, otherwise they would not survive for this long. Thank you. Fantastic. I'd just like we to mention before the voting happens, just to remind you that I am a fourth Dan black belt in karate. So <laughs> Does that translate via the camera as well? That threat. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Slightly concerned now. Cool. Very good. I enjoyed that very much. Thank you very much for that. I like to hear about the mercenaries and even the suicide that we heard about as well. An interesting one for defense. I'm kind of wrapping up with messages being communicated as well. Uh, but yeah, very good point. If they live for thousands of years, clearly they need to have good defenses. So let's move on, shall we? Let's hand the bat on over to Team Bat. And I believe we are going over to Naomi to hear the case for bat defense. Absolutely. And I have to say, if your your biggest thing is we've stayed in one place for a thousand years, it's, how exciting can that really have been? I think, you know, fundamentally, the amazing, amazing thing about bats is, of course, that they can fly. They don't just have, sit around uh, and wait for things to happen. Uh, they are able to move around, get out of danger if they want to, go off and have adventures. Uh, and so here is some wonderful footage um, from the BBC of a brown long-eared bat actually flying. Uh, and I think that is one of the incredible things um, that bats do to defend themselves. But the other one, as you can see, we've had to light up the bat uh, here because they don't just stick around in the same place day in, day out. Uh, they come out at night when there are fewer predators, when the risks are lower and they can um, keep themselves that much safer. So they don't just sit around like some mouldy old castle waiting for things to attack them. They are off having adventures, enjoying the world. Uh, so, um, as I said, they can they can fly, and they are incredible um, flyers. Just to, to show you, this is um, a pipistrelle catching a, a midge. Uh, this is a thermal imaging um, footage that um, I've kindly borrowed from Ian Baker. Uh, and so, this is how quick that was in real time. Um, but they're able to find this tiny little midge in the pitch black in midair. Uh, they've got the incredible echolocation to help them find it. But just to show you what incredible acrobatic um, flyers they are, you can see how those wings, it's the same bones that we have in our hands, and yet they're able to turn them into these incredible wings, find these uh, all sorts of different angles to enable them to take all sorts of uh, shapes, uh, but do it at a high speed. Uh, it's just incredible when you have a look at these slow motion um, frames taken out of that. Uh, and that is a tenth of a second. You can see that they were how fast they're actually doing it. Um, and they're also highly efficient because they time that. Um, the, the pulse um, of the echolocation calls match their wing beats because they're just that efficient. Um, so they are have this incredible um, 
method of defense in terms of using their flight, um, but they will also uh, use the sound as well. So I'm hoping if this one will also play, there we go. So this is actually, this is some more of Ian's footage. This is actually um, a greater horseshoe bat roost um, with uh, a number of juveniles flying around there. Uh, Ian was particularly interested in, you can see the heat distribution pattern across uh, the animals with the different muscles showing up as brighter white, the hotter they are, and then the cooler parts of the bats being that bit darker. And you can particularly see the wings. Um, but you can see that they're able to, even though it's dark, um, they're still able to um, um, find their way around, avoid each other. But equally, you'll see in a moment, we've got a bit more footage where they start getting a little bit um, closer to one another. Uh, and the way that they uh, navigate, of course, as I mentioned before, it's the echolocation. They're bouncing sound off each other so they can um, find out what's around them, whether it's the other bats, whether it's the, the, the barn itself, which is where this roost was actually um, uh, situated. Uh, and so they can... Um, fly around um, but they can do all of this at incredibly high speed so it's not a case of sitting around with nothing going on um, but being on the move looking after yourself protecting yourself the whole time from all sorts of things uh, even uh, occasionally one of your friends that may be getting a little bit too close um, but they will also use that sound uh, to be a little bit more aggressive when they need to so here there's actually uh, the ultrasounds, those echolocation uh, and social calls being used to blast each other. And the thing about bats is we tend to think that they're uh, quite quiet because we can't hear them. Bats are actually really loud. Bats are louder than a rock concert. Uh, so just because we can't hear them doesn't mean they are perhaps these quiet, pathetic things. They may be calling very high pitched, but because it's so high pitched, it's going to attenuate, so you've got to be loud. Uh, so yeah, 140 decibels, you blast that in your friend's ear, they're going to get out of the way pretty quickly. Uh, so I think bats have some incredible defenses, um, not just uh, sitting around relying on fungi to help defend you uh, or uh, enjoying a very slow, uh, sad, quiet death in one place. Bats are out there, they are living in a very exciting, fast paced world uh, and they're living it loud. Okay, so I think bats have far better, more impressive defenses than trees. Lovely job. Thank you, Naomi. An interesting start there, which was basically, well, they just run away, right? An interesting case to make for defense. They're just like, oh, they're getting in trouble. Light is away. a great form of defense. Get yourself they, out of trouble. Let's be honest, though. Trees can't fly. Well, I would beg to disagree with that based on what we heard earlier on from Alan on the, the flying place. Rowan. It was in the same place. That's not flying. Just the, the time scales you're viewing it on are different. You need to think about things in tree time, I would suggest, Naomi. Um, but you brought it back. There was some chat in the kind of chat going on about uh, the best defense is a good offense. So I think the chat came to your rescue slightly there about kind of focusing mainly on. I was say, yeah, they've done very well. I could have used them like half an hour ago when I was still writing the presentation. <laughs> very good. But then it turned out that even bats on the same team were fighting with one another. You can't even get your own house in order. Well, you never know who you're going to have to defend against. <laughs> very true. Very true. There's some more low blows coming in the chat from people talking about bats getting tangled in the hair. So I think we need to address that. That is a myth. I've never had a bat get tangled in my hair. Uh, and I, to be honest, I don't know anyone that has. You know, if you've got echolocation, you know exactly where stuff is. I mean, most of the time, unless they Absolutely. play into you. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, when we go out and we catch bats, the, the nets we use are kind of probably finer than human hair and the bats can see them. So, yeah, these... Stop these influencing the vote, Jim. No, no, no. I was brought to be, I was brought in to be impartial. I'm on both Team Tree and Team Bat. Both the team wanted to claim me to speak, but I said, no, no, no. Someone needs to be impartial here. But I'm just going to call out like blatant lies or myths when I hear them or I see them. So I'm going to call that out. Anyway, I'll move on. Lovely. So we've heard about defence. Shall we put it to the vote then? Let's see where we go. We're currently tied 50-50. So let's, let's see where we go from here. Remember, you can pledge your allegiance on social media as well by hashtag Team Bat or Team Tree. Let's see where we go for defence then. Okay. 
vote trees people now who's influencing the votes john he has the power just keep keep typing away in the chat it's not even your turn you've had your turn you've had one of your turns at least okay shall we see how we got on trees take it raised arms from team's tree there just edging into the lead then i've note that down okay okay two more rounds to sort it so up next then this could be the the decider for team tree team's about to need to claim this to hold on okay so we Over have got games. we have got uh, round four which is most friends an interesting one shall we see how this is been interpreted by our panelists. So I believe from Team Bat, we have Naomi again. So good. <laughs> we heard from her twice. Your audio last time was a little bit distorted, a little bit echoey. I don't know whether there's anything you can do to improve that. I'm happy to go to Team Tree first if you want a bit of a bit of time to see if you can sort that. Uh, I think it's going to be the room that I'm in. I am welcome to go and have a rummage, but it may take longer than I'm allowed. So okay. is it, am I sufficiently legible that people can hear me or do I need, I'm getting some nodding. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to carry on because sure. either that, or I'm going to say, you know, maybe we, we will need to rematch for both of mine and I'll need to redo my. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> After the vote's been cast, I see. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's great. I, I can hear you. There was a comment in the chat about it. I think um, perhaps some people who English isn't the first language may have struggled possibly, but um, we Apologize. will. I do will... speak too fast. I will try and slow down. In my excitement, uh, I will try and slow down as I'm now going to talk to you a little bit about bats and how, how they get their friends. Uh, and they have a lot of friends out there. So I'm going to start uh, here in the UK with the insectivorous bats. Uh, and as the name suggests, they do eat all sorts of insects, uh, whether it's moths, midges, mosquitoes. And I have to admit that I'm one of those people that gets bitten by mosquitoes a lot, uh, and I don't like mosquitoes. I'm going to put it out there. I apologize to any mosquito fans out there, but I don't like mosquitoes. And so this is just one of the many reasons that I like that, is because they eat loads of midges and mosquitoes. Uh, you know, or th they linger around under all those uh, beautiful trees, ruining it for us in the evening. So uh, it's great to have bats around to eat all these uh, mosquitoes for us. But they don't just do that. They're actually doing um, an incredible job of pest control um, for farmers for all sorts of crops. Uh, and they, um, as they start doing some of their calculations, I think it's over a billion dollars. It was an American study, um, but it's over a billion dollars just on corn um, crops that bats actually help to um, to protect um, with their pest suppression um, role. Uh, and so you can scale that up for all of the different um, crops and things that bats help to look after, you know, rice and, and so many around the world. Uh, and particularly at a time when we're trying to reduce our reliance on chemicals, Bats are totally the farmer's friends. Uh, so um, I think, you know, bats have an incredible number of friends um, because of their role as pest control. Uh, and, oh, these slides are going to move in any, any moment. There we go. And just to show um, that they're really good at doing this um, without damaging the crop, I'm just going to show you one more quick uh, bit of footage. So this is actually a natter as bat. And I know someone's going to go, it's a spider, it's not an insect. But, you know, they'll eat them too. But look you know, totally undamaged crop. Um, not, it's uh, very, very helpful. Uh, so a nectivorous bat, though. Um, so I don't know how many people out there uh, enjoy maybe tequila or uh, mezcal or uh, some of these. Um, that is thanks to a lot of our, um, our bats out there who help to pollinate um, the agaves. Uh, now, I know there's a lot of other things out there that can, can help pollinate um, uh, some flowers, but there are some that are really specialized for bats to be able to come in, you know, and they have this lovely mutualism and the bats get to have a nice drink of nectar uh, and the agaves get to have that um, exchange of genetic material that's actually really, really important because you may know they can uh, reproduce asexually, but we all know that's not good in the long term for disease uh, protection and things like this. So what you really want is to have a bat coming in, moving that pollen around, and they can move it so much further than just as some old insect might do. A bigger bat, they can fly further, you'll get much greater uh, 
genetic diversity happening. So, uh, and it's all sorts of other um, things that are out there. There are some cacti that have specifically adapted themselves uh, to be able to um, be pollinated um, by the bats. Um, you know, there's all sorts of fruit trees and things out there that uh, have bats come in and do their pollinating. Uh, so trees need bats. Uh, in a lot of cases. Um, and so bats like to be friends to trees as well. Um, you've also got some um, uh, more fruit, uh, the fruit bats out there who are playing another crucial role for trees, uh, being such good friends to trees because they disperse their seeds. Uh, you know, there's again a nice um, reciprocal relationship uh, with the fruit being offered to tempt the bats in. Uh, they'll come in with their great eyesight and their fantastic sense of smell. So that whole rumor about blind as a bat, just not true. Here we've got a fantastic Livingston's fruit bat flying in, five foot wingspan, beautiful uh, red eyes that they will use to find the right fruit amongst the leaves, enjoy a nice little snack and then fly off and deposit the uh, seeds as they go, even providing a little bit of fertilizer along the way. How generous is that? Uh, they are very good friends. And of course, I can't miss out some of our cave dwelling bats particularly as within a cave ecosystem, the bats are the ones who bring the nutrition. There are no trees or anything like that to actually provide um, the starting point uh, for in an ecosystem. So you can end up with all sorts of um, everything from the fungi and the bacteria and the microorganisms all the way up through various invertebrates uh, to then having um, salamanders and the, the, uh, the blind cave fish, all sorts of animals that are only able to inhabit these unique cave ecosystems because of the bats. Uh, if that's not a brilliant thing for your uh, batty to be reason to be friends with bats, I don't know what is. Uh, and I ran out of time here, I confess, but humans, we have so many reasons to be uh, grateful to bats and be friends with them. But one of the biggest ones, someone did touch on it in the uh, chat earlier, I saw, but it is, there is some incredible research going on into bats. Um, because of their aging and their health, which we can then apply to humans because we're, you know, friends, we're all mammals, we can learn a lot from each other. But bats, for such tiny creatures, live an incredibly long time. Um, we're actually looking at the the telomeres uh, and, and how they're able to, on their chromosomes, uh, which they think are part of it, but they also have this high disease resistance. They can be um, carrying um, diseases and not be affected by various um, diseases that they're carrying. And so there's a lot that we can then learn to improve human health. Uh, so if that's not uh, one of the best reasons to be friends with bats, I don't know what is. Ooh, Thank okay. you very much. An introduction there to kind of most friends, indeed. Thank you very much for that. You brought in some of the big guns with David Attenborough, Life of Mammals footage of Natarus taking the, the spider out of the web. Very nice. Well, you know, if, if I'm allowed to name drop, then yes, another friend of bats, David Attenborough. <laughs> I'm fairly sure he's also a friend of trees, in fact. I know, that? I regretted that as soon as I said yeah, it. <laughs> you, can't, you cannot claim David for for uh, for Team Bat, I'm afraid. I had a, a ask Vicky once, I had this thing, I asked people, of, what's the, the best famous person you've ever met? And Vicky told me once that she bumped into David Atterborough at the National Natural History Museum, like physically collided with him, which is a pretty good one. I think that's kind of close to winning that game. Uh, you talked about bats and trees being friends. That's nice. We're getting a bit of harmony here. There's a bit of smack talk happening in the in the chat again. There's even someone asking about bats peeing in your eyes and mouth. I think you need to find a new hobby. I don't know what you're yeah, up to. I, mean, to, to I, I will hold my hands up there. I spent 10 years working in a zoo. And one of the first things they did tell me was, you know, if you're in the fruit bat enclosure, do keep your mouth shut because, you know, as I've said, they may be flying over. But, you know, if you are wandering around with your mouth open in any animal enclosure in a zoo, you're kind of asking for trouble, aren't you? Indeed. Indeed. Cool. OK. Lovely job. Thank you very much for that, Naomi. So for Team Tree... We have good friend Vicky. Are you going to tell us about most friends in relation to trees, please? Oh, definitely, definitely. And I'm feeling a bit of Monty Python coming on for me now. You know, it's kind of like, what have trees ever done for us? Yeah, a lot of people have said it in the chat already. You know, oxygen, that's a pretty important thing. And I think actually even bats would be quite glad to have some oxygen. Shade, they keep us, you know, sheltered. They take up pollution. 
I think actually, you know, this is an easy one to win as far as I'm concerned, apart from them being absolutely beautiful. You know, we all love trees. We can't help ourselves. We climb in them when we're kids. We congregate to them when we're outside. They're just fantastic things to be around. And they make you feel good. People have already talked about that. You know, the kind of the forest bathing, but actually old trees, they, 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 they just give us that peace, that sense of history, that sense of time. And then of course, you know, there are some numbers that we can chuck in here. I think there's about 21,000 people in the UK working with trees. That's more people than live in my nearest town. Admittedly, I live in Sweden that they bring in people who work with trees, bring in over 700 million to the UK, to its GDP. That's about the same as John Parker's salary, I think, as CEO of the Arb Association. So, you know, we can bring some numbers in there. And of course, you know, I'm an ecologist. I'm going to talk about the value that trees have for other species because, you know, that's where their biggest group of friends are. Now, I actually have just held myself to the UK, I would like to say, and I'm feeling slightly cheated because the BAT team have gone all around the world. And, you know, I've not done that. I've held myself to our, you know, small number of trees that we have in the UK. And we know that there are more than 10,000 species associated with trees. And if I take away the 18 BATs, that gives us 9,982 species associated with trees that are not BATs. So I think we're, we're on to a bit of a winner there. And of course, you know, what can you say? This is a single individual tree that's got hundreds of different places for friends to live and everyone's welcome, whether you like a sunny balcony, if you like a shady, damp spot, or whether you like a little nook or a cranny, or whether you like to fly high with your, you know, by the seat of your pants, you've got a place to live in just a single individual tree. And of course, fungi. I think Lynn and others have always said a tree is not a tree without fungi. The friends associated with trees include the mycorrhizal fungi, the wood decay fungi. You know, there are thousands of species associated with trees and we can't say anything else but that mycorrhizae are friends of trees. They may be mercenaries as well. They get something in return, but they're definitely friends. Then we've got the invertebrates. There's thousands of species of insects and other invertebrates that live on trees with trees, whether they're dead or alive, actually, many of them are not that fussy. And, you know, let's face it, the tree, even hundreds of years after it's died, can still be a home to lots of friends. Lichens and bryophytes, they're also the fact the trees are stable. Now, Naomi, you were, you were saying there the fact that trees don't move. Well, actually, that gives them more friends, in my view, because they're stable, they sit still, that allows the fungi, the lichens, the bryophytes to colonize them, and they change over time, adapting their homes for the species associated with them. Birds, of course, they love trees, they require them. We have the woodpeckers that make the holes that then in turn all sorts of other bird species come on. And then of course the mammals, but I'm not mentioning bats on purpose. This is the bear, loves the trees as well, but there are other mammals, of course, that we know love trees, mice, uh, not least. That's my favorite discovery relatively recently, Jim, and I've been sharing photographs of wood mice in hollows in trees. And then if we just talk about oak, and that's a tree species that we've got, you know, just our humble oak tree in the UK, 2,300 species. And of those 2,300 species, almost a thousand of them are actually either entirely or completely associated with oak and nothing else. Now, I don't know about you, but I do not have 2,300 friends on Facebook. So, you know, I think trees win it hands down as far as I'm concerned. We all love trees. We're all friends of trees. That's why we're here. I have nothing more to say. The defence rests. <laughs> Some very strong numbers in there. Thank you very much for that. And absolutely, we heard about wood decay fungi in there as well. And they're kind of crucial for bats who live in trees. Yeah, it's a, an interesting one, this. I think bats have a, a kind of case to make here. Uh, we have just heard that our final panellist um, from Team Bats 
unfortunately isn't able to join us. He was here, but his internet in the hotel he's in isn't sufficient. So uh, this is our, our crucial vote, I'm afraid. So we're going to have to cut it short and stick to four categories. So I, I, um, I have got a presentation, whoa. Jim, and I've just been writing it for the last 20 minutes. So I'd like to give it, please. OK. Just so you, people can vote on one presentation. Is that right? OK, fair enough. Can we not, can we not vote on their ours first, though, surely? Come sure, on, guys. sure. Yeah, I was yeah, mainly yeah. saying this is the crucial vote. This is the last opportunity that Team Bat have to crawl back some pride. So shall we, shall we launch the vote? Naomi was absolutely gobsmacked and offended there, but too slow to unmute herself to kind of rebut before the, the vote came in. You had to John. vote. <laughs> Tell me, how many Facebook friends have the Arb Association got? The Ancient Tree Forum have got 10,000. So 5,000 is nothing. Plah. Well, see, I would have to consult with uh, Joe to remind me how many friends we've got on, on Facebook. I feel like it might be more. Okay. And trees take it. Congratulations, Vicky. Commiserations, Naomi. But that means by a, a score of three to four to sorry, three to one, can't count, can I? That team trees have it. Thank you very much for that. That was fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Thanks for all the, the chat going on. I, I think John wanted to say a few final words. Did you want to give your final presentation, John? Or not? Well, I feel can I can I just say what I was gonna say? because I do feel like I was a bit stressed half an hour ago. And then I felt quite happy two minutes ago because I'd done it. And then it was, so I was just, for, for the last category was distance traveled. And I was hoping that we'd have a fantastic presentation about a bat that had managed to go like 20 meters or however far they go. And, and so I was going to say, I could have spoken at, at great length about pollen and how far pollen can travel or winged seeds or plant collectors. Um, but what I wanted to do instead, I was just going to talk about this little tree here, which I've got in my hand. And some of you would have seen me give presentations involving this tree before. But um, uh, this tree here is rather special. Um, not joking for a minute, serious bit. Uh, as, as we all know, in, um, uh, on August the 6th, 1945, uh, an atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima in Japan. Tens of thousands of people died at the time. Tens of thousands of people uh, died later. Um, and but some trees very near the blast site survived. And um, in 2011, an amazing project was started called Green Legacy Hiroshima, uh, which you can Google. It's well worth looking at. We're going to have a presentation from the people who've sorted out in a, in a future webinar. But they collected seeds from these incredible survivor trees and they send them out around the world as a sort of a, a symbol of uh, hope and everything to, to different botanical gardens and arboretum. So. This one here, this isn't my finest one, but I didn't know I was going to be giving this presentation until I get to what got to work. This is the one I keep at work. Like all of you, I keep a ginkgo at home, one at work for emergencies. And I'm really glad I did. They thought I was crazy. They said I was crazy. But no, look. Um, but this little seed was a seed, now a little seedling, uh, has traveled 9,479 kilometers or, and I did work this out, 5,890 miles from Hiroshima to be here in Stonehouse to go into the Stonehouse Community Arboretum. And what an amazing symbol of hope and international collaboration and peace. Uh, and isn't it wonderful and definitely better than a bat. So uh, please uh, vote tree is what I would have said, but now I don't need to because we won anyway. Oh, I mean, John, it's a beautiful story and you know, nice touch to bring in Hiroshima. I have to admit your, your polit politician roots are definitely showing there. I mean, I'm pretty sure that Daniel will, would probably have wanted to mention um, the one the, the BBC nicknamed the Olympian bat, um, which flew um, over 2000 kilometers as part of its migration. And obviously the thing about migration is that you tend to go there and back. It's not just a one way way trip but I'm also going to just also um if we are thinking about you know the impact that war can have at times um if you haven't seen there's an incredible group of um Ukrainians who've been carrying out their bat rehabilitation work despite the war going on around them at the moment uh, and I mean 
one of the amazing things is that um, trees are incredibly resilient. You know, they, they are amazing. Bats really do need a lot of help right now. And it's been amazing to hear how, despite all of the awfulness that's been going on for them, um, they've still, they managed to release a lot of their bats that they could release. And the ones they haven't been able to release, they've been looking after them um, while they're going on. Uh, and so, uh, you know, a big shout out. I, I, you know, I want to just say a big thank you to all of the bat carers around the world who do their bit, um, raising awareness uh, of bats and the help that they need, and then the individual work and care that they do. Gail um, is a particularly fabulous bat carer who does lots of stuff for us as well. Uh, and, you know, I, I do, the, you know, freely admit that uh, we need trees uh, and I think we need bats. And so uh, I'd like to think that the, hopefully the future will uh, involve uh, a really thriving future with both bats and trees um, together. But if anyone does want to learn more about that, uh, and or get involved with their conservation then then do get in touch if you don't already follow us on social media uh, please do and equally any of the batty people out there there are some pretty cool things to learn about trees it turns out I'm sure uh, the Arb Association would be up for helping you uh, to do that as well fantastic thank you very much there's some comments coming in the chat lots of thanks and praise all round for both teams and so I guess it just remains for me to thank both Teams Bat and Teams Trees and all our wonderful speakers. Congratulations. Thanks for your time. I, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. It kind of got uh, a bit raucous at times, didn't it? But I think we, we kind of part still being friends. And maybe one day we can have a, a rematch if uh, Team Bat can get themselves to get themselves together. Oh, I think there will be. And I'm, I'm going to be thinking more carefully about what rounds we put in next time. I feel like Trees had a bit too much of an advantage. Next time, I'm going to even the playing field. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, they've had 350 odd million years of evolution. So they kind of they've been around. They've got a few things sorted. Good stuff. OK, well, thank you all. I think it just remains to say goodbye. See you again soon. Cheerio.